uh, what I'd like is for each of us um, just to uh, close our eyes and imagine that we are what we're seeking. Mm. We are that which is we are seeking. And imagine that you are already that which is always present. Imagine it in your mind, but in your body, in your breathing. And now simply turn off your imagination and rest in that which is always present and know that that is you. May it always be so. Thank you, Bruce. Let's meditate. Welcome. <laughs> Good. So sit upright with uh, good posture. Inhale and exhale through your nose and take a few deep breaths and uh, go ahead and stretch a little bit as if you're waking up. Breathe into any tension you have and on the exhale, relax. Just a few stretches. Inhale, stretch. Exhale, relax. Inhale, stretch. Exhale, relax. Inhale, stretch. Exhale, relax. And settle into your meditation posture. Now bring to your attention any mental or emotional stresses that have been with you or accumulated throughout the day. And on the inhale, see them clearly, bring them clearly into your awareness. And on the exhale, let them fall away. And on the inhale, bring them clearly into your awareness. And on the exhale, let them fall away. Now let's focus on the breath. As usual, if you notice your attention has strayed, just gently bring your attention back to the breath. Now, keeping your attention on the breath, imagine you are inhaling through the top of your head and imagine you are exhaling out the bottom of your feet. Now imagine you are inhaling through the right side of your body 
and imagine you are exhaling out of the left side of your body. Now, imagine you are inhaling through the left side of your body, and imagine you are exhaling out of the right side of your body. Now imagine you are inhaling through the back of your body and imagine you are exhaling out of the front of your body. Now imagine you are inhaling through the front of the body. Imagine you are exhaling out of the back of the body. Now, inhale through the solar plexus and exhale evenly out of the entire body.
as you exhale, imagine you are radiating white light. Out of the entire body. Now just allow the breath to continue on its own. Allow the mind and the intention to do what it will. There's no need to imagine anything. Just relax and allow everything to take care of itself. As we conclude the meditation, don't rush. Allow consciousness to ease smoothly back into engaging with the world. So last month, I, I think where we left off, at least uh, as far as I can remember, is with a kind of question about, excuse me, how we can use imagination in our practice. Hey, Matthew. Yeah. Before we go on, I would be interested if anyone had any comments mm -hmm. or reaction to that meditation. Sure. I liked it. 
<laughs> well, yeah, why don't you give us your comment or reaction, Bruce? I, you know, and I think we'll talk about it. You know, imagining the flow of breath you know what's imagining and what's real they it's it's um um i don't know there was a a purification or something uh, you know i could imagine you know i liked it when it went um uh, i sort of tracked it with my you know my eyes went but anyway i it i'm it it um it worked for i got i liked it yeah yeah, um, this uh, you know it it um, it feels like a wind blowing through you. Yeah, um, this kind of work. Um, I did a lot of training in this kind of practice. My teacher called it permeation. You can do it with all different kinds of things: with the breath, with tension, with awareness itself, um, and so it's a it's actually. Uh, a very deep practice. There's many, many things you can do with it. Uh, with move, also you can do it. Obviously, just sitting, but also movement, um, laying down, different positions. Uh, anyway, uh, anyone else have any comments or thoughts? Yeah, I was experiencing like lines of energy going in and out. Um, felt it, it. It felt pretty symmetrical, which surprised me, but. Every like six inches in my body, different lines of energy were coming in and out. Nice. Yeah, when you do these kinds of, it's a lot like different, uh, like my exposure comes through this kind of practice, but from what I've read about Vipassana meditation, there's a similarity with that kind of practice where <clears throat> you're looking, you're looking at what's actually going on inside your body. And the the by using the breath in different directions, you're um, uh, bringing your attention through all kinds of different layers of the body. You may become aware of different things, um, and uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, it's an interesting practice, and if you enjoy it, I encourage you to do it. If you do, for example, sitting meditation, and you occasionally do like a body scan exercise, you can do this in place of the body scan. It's kind of you know it's the same kind of thing. So you're just using the breath to scan the body, essentially. I usually like guided visualizations, and 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 they usually are fairly easy for me. And I sort of think of imagining as sort of you know, anything goes, right? Everything is equally imaginable. But I found that I was more able to imagine certain directions than others. Ah, you know? Well, that's I thought I, I was surprised by that actually. See, yeah. that's something to investigate. It it can be due to to um asymmetrical tension patterns in the body. Uh it can it can be due to um just your ability to imagine one way is better than the other, you know? Uh, so that's a, if you notice things like that in doing this, it's, that's something to investigate. So next time you do it, look at that, see, oh, can I get it to move smoothly both directions and so on. And, uh, and incidentally, you can, you can breathe in and out of any part of the body. So you, once you understand this principle or what it feels like to breathe in a particular area and out a particular area, you can uh, you can um, improvise. You know your own. You know you can breathe in one arm, out the other arm. In both arms, out both legs. In right arm, out left leg. So you can pass the breath through the body in all kinds of different directions. Um, yeah, and. You know, when I when I learned these drills, uh, I added the imagine breathe in through the head and breathe out through the, the feet because that's the topic tonight. But generally, I would just say breathe in your head, breathe out your feet. And so and people would say, how do you breathe in your head? And I guess the answer would be imagine it and you'll see, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. OK, thank you. Yeah, of course. So um, so anyway, yeah, this is an obvious example, right, of how we can use imagination or practice. 
we talked last month um, about small imagination and big imagination in the same way that we often consider uh, idea of small self and big self and so on. And many, many practices involve the, the small imagination, right? our personal, like this, we're imagining it. We imagine we do this, we imagine we do this. Um, if you do a visualization practice, that's a kind of uh, uh, individual personal imagination. Um, if you reflect on like uh, the attributes of God or something like that, this is also you, you're actively using your imagination to imagine what um, is. Uh, so we uh, imagine what the higher reality is and endeavor to engage with that. Um, just like we did in the meditation, we imagine something, the breath, doing something with the breath, and we engage with it. Um, it's good. Like I said, lots of practices use this, um, but it's uh, but it's limited. It's always us imagining it, right? And the other way to use imagination in practice is to endeavor to go beyond the imagination. So like, as Bruce suggested, don't imagine anything and see what's left. Uh, we take, in other words, we take the imagination to mean uh, all image creation. In other words, uh, in, whether internal or external, perceptual or mental. Uh, in other words, uh, just all phenomena, basically, because if you, if you consider all phenomena, what is it other than um, internal, or external, perceptual, or mental. See, that's it. that's everything. And if there's other categories, you can just add them. You know. Um, so to go beyond, we have to dismiss all these imagined phenomena, uh, which amounts to all phenomena. So whatever uh, it is that you can identify or imagine, either through perception, uh, through thought. Um, through imagination, <laughs> the small imagination and so on, uh, you dismiss that and then uh, see what's left. We'll uh, I have a couple exercises for you um, a little bit later and we'll, so we'll we'll try try this out. It's essentially uh, looking you're you're looking for nothing. How do you look for nothing? Well, you have you, the only way to do it is to is not to, look for something called nothing, because that's just going to be another thing. The only way really to do it is to dismiss all particular things. Uh, that's the way to look uh, for nothing. So, um, but before we get there, I, <clears throat> Bruce sent a few questions to me, and I thought they were good questions, and I thought about them this morning, so I'll just share with you um, some of the answers, since they're relevant to the um, discussion, and then we'll do a little exercise and discuss the results. Okay. So, and before I I read the questions off, um, does do any of you have a question that yeah. you have right now? Yeah, even better. Dump the teacher. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm going to read question. my questions, but please, if you have a question um, or follow-up or anything, uh, this is really meant to be a discussion. Um, um, so in practice, is there a difference between visualizing and imagining the presence of a deity and feeling or becoming the presence? So um, there's a difference, right? Just in the way the question is phrased. Uh, it, when using the, like the small, again, the small imagination, there's an obvious difference. When you imagine, let's say you imagine the presence of a deity, it's external to you. If you imagine being that presence, it's internal to you. So uh, the next kind of uh, thing that I would say is that to go uh, beyond just imagining, there's no internal or external. There's no you imagining it. And in that case, there's just the 
there's just a deity. In other words, uh, you know, we're always trying to get to this place where there's nothing but that. In other words, oneness. There's nothing other than reality. There's nothing other than God. There's nothing other than consciousness. Everything is united. So that's going beyond all imagination. I mean, we're just imagining it now, but you <laughs> that's the direction to go in. Yeah. I'm going to give opportunities for follow-up questions. Yeah, if anybody has questions, just jump in. Yeah, what's a deity? Ah, good, good question. <laughs> uh, all, you know, like all questions of definition, the answer is really, uh, uh, let's see, what kind of answer can you give? Nothing at all. That's an answer. See, you know, if, if we're discussing philosophy, you know, we come up with all, we would try to come up with a, um, a positive definition. You know, it's like uh, you could say a deity is a, a god or something like that. And then you say, well, what's that? And then you we say, well, uh, a god is all powerful, all knowing, all good. See, those are classical definitions of god. But the, the reality is actually beyond any definition that we can imagine. So any word that people come up with, if you say, what is that? Like, remember last month we discussed what is imagination? Ultimately, it's nothing at all. So we'll always try, I'm always trying to talk toward a place where there is, uh, there is nothing but one reality. So any particular thing, be it a deity, or imagination, a cat, a tree, the sky, you, the mind. If it's a particular thing, ultimately I'd say it's nothing at all. It's just an idea. When I lived in Israel, um and I was exposed to a lot of uh, Orthodox people, or maybe even ultra-religious people. Um, they refer to the deity, they refer to God as the name. Like, blessed is the name. Like, you can't say anything about it other than maybe they would say, we're ain't soft, like the endless, you know. Yeah. But the, they go to great lengths to not name it. Right. And the, the, the reason that we have that tradition and other traditions like it, like in Islam, you're not... Uh, allowed to depict actually that's maybe in judaism too just no depictions right. of god right and so on the the that's precisely why we have that um those traditions it's to remind you that the reality is beyond any name or word beyond any concept and anytime you um Ooh. conceptualize the reality it's like a kind of idolatry mm. you're turning reality into uh an idea or a particular thing you know the boundless limitless reality into something bounded limited and conception conceptual so the next question is sort of a parallel question and that is that you know, many of us have spiritual or exceptional weird experiences. Sometimes we, we ignore them. Sometimes we give them great meaning. Um, uh, so Matthew, uh, tell us, I mean, are these imagined? Are they real? Um, What's what do we take away from you know these weird experiences uh, that we have? Let's let's first take a, a survey. I, this is one of I, I, I'm always interested in this question is uh, you know how many people have had an experience that is you would describe as strange, weird, 
outside the norm, extraordinary spiritual experience, or um, yeah, how many people have experience like this? Yeah, <laughs> I just have this, I just have this um, suspicion that if if we were to, um, you, you know, take a take this question to the masses that the the number of people who have such experiences is, is is much much larger than we might imagine uh largely because many people who have such experiences just dismiss them uh because they dismiss them they forget about them so even if they say no nothing like that's ever happened to me uh it's possible it did they just um dismiss it um and uh, other reasons are the the experiences are so subjective, they're so personal um, that they're uh, afraid to voice them because uh, maybe uh, uh, people don't accept it or they don't, um, I don't know, yeah. Anyhow, as far as the experiences being real or not real, um, I can say on my own path, I had these strange experiences, and I certainly asked this question, is, is this real or not real? Um, and I uh, was never able to come to any conclusion. And I'm convinced now this was a good, uh, a good way to deal with it. Uh, so whatever the experience is that you have, um, if you're seeking kind of like some kind of knowledge about whether it's real or unreal, don't accept anything less than uh, absolute knowledge. You have to really know. So if you don't know, it's okay to don't know. In fact, I would say this is uh, the best way to deal with these experiences. Um, don't try to use any unusual experience as like a... Uh, confirmation of a an existing view that you have, uh, nor as the uh, cornerstone of a new view that you're trying to build. Just accept the experiences as they are. You know, these experiences um, uh, usually arise spontaneously. Uh, in the same way that you could say the present experience is arising spontaneously. They're not willfully imagined. They just arise like a dream or like this present experience. Still, you could wonder whether they're real or not real, but you could wonder that about the present experience too. So... That's why I say just take experiences as they are. Could you share the experience of uh, seeing yourself uh, through the eyes of a seagull? Sure. Which is not really a spiritual experience. No, but it was Where? unusual. Yeah. Yeah. So I was in um, Australia. Well, I was 19 years old and I had traveled to Australia to go on an adventure, you know. And I was in, I think I had just arrived in Australia and I was exploring around the area in Sydney. I was at uh, Bondi Beach and north of the beach are all these um, kind of rocky cliffs and stuff like that overlooking the water. And I had gone up there, uh, found a spot on the rocks and sat down to basically uh, meditate, look out at the water. And I was watching these birds, uh, seagulls, and um, just, uh, you know, floating in the air currents over the water. Uh, and suddenly, I could see absolutely clearly uh, myself as if I was looking out of the eyes of this bird. And it, it lasted a few moments. Uh, and then I was back in my own perspective. But it was, uh, you know, absolutely clear, totally, totally clear what had happened. You know, so 
um, like a lot of these experiences, my reaction was always, uh, I recognize something sort of extraordinary had happened, but what do you do about that? You know, you just go about your business, you know, at least that's what I did. <laughs> you know? Was it, was it accompanied by the sudden craving for raw fish? No, no, it's too brief. <laughs> It was too brief for the hunger to build up. <laughs> Either that or that particular seagull had already eaten that day. <laughs> yeah. the, the other interesting thing about these experiences is that if you try to replicate them, it may not be possible. I, it, it, <laughs> yeah, of course, of course, uh, probably not. Probably as we were talking, Bruce, over the over the weekend or or on um, Wednesday, really impossible. How do you how do you replicate an experience that happens spontaneously? If you try to do it, the experience is already different, it, it, whether it whether it happens or not, because the because the original experience arose spontaneously. And when we talked about this. Um... Uh, over the last year, as I had experiences meditating or or working with stuff that Matthew had given me, and then I went back back the next day and say, "Oh, I'm going to do that again." Um, it didn't work. <laughs> uh, so it, it's it is interesting that th those things really are you know one time spontaneous events. So here's your next question, Matthew. How can imagination lead to truth? That's an interesting question. Okay, so the, the small imagination can only lead to truth by seeing through it, by going beyond it. Mm. So that's often likened to recognizing that you're in a dream or when you realize that what you're seeing is a mirage. I don't know what you mean when you say going beyond it. Do you mean going beyond the imagination or going beyond the truth you're seeing, you think you're seeing? I, I didn't quite get what you meant. A going beyond the imagination. So the question is, how can imagination lead to truth? And so I'm saying the, the small imagination, the small personal imagination, like if we imagine a seagull or an apple or whatever it is, see, it's always a particular thing. The truth isn't a particular thing. So the only way that the small imagination can lead us to the truth is by um, using the imagination to go beyond the imagination. And, you know, in the spiritual literature, that's likened to like uh, waking up in a dream and realizing that you're dreaming or that what you're looking at uh, is a mirage. Or the classic example is you... Uh, it's late at night and you see a snake in the alleyway and you get scared and run away. The next morning you go back and you see, oh, it was just a coil of rope. So I can, share, can I share an example of something that I've been working with? I'm really trying to imagine that I am literally made in the image of God. So feeling worthy enough to really claim that, 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 that I am that. However, however, um, I need to surrender to the truth of that because I make up stuff in my mind as to what that means. And the only, the only way I get really bad is I try to, I try to, um, I'm trying to kind of acknowledge um, uh, Mark's question, you know, because I have this imagination that I made in the image of God um, and I'm trying to deepen my relationship to that, um, to that, but I have to let go of that imagination to experience something that feels more real to me. Yeah. So, you know, what I would say is that, uh, instead of imagining that you are worthy of that, you have to realize that you are not worthy of that. And that's meant to help you to let go of yourself. Yeah. So the ego. Yes, the ego yeah. will never be worthy yeah. of being God. Right. This, Correct. You know, yeah. this is absolutely a fundamental mistake 
Uh, so, so I think that this whole conversation around imagination is ego based. Yes, that and that is why I said the yeah. only way that you can use imagination to reach the truth is to go beyond it. You have to yeah. transcend the imagination. Yeah. Otherwise, it's all unless you're talking about the big imagination, like I mentioned last month, in the sense that the imagination that is the power that makes all things happen, that makes everything happen, that makes you happen and me happen and our small imagination happen and the world happen and the whole universe happen. That imagination, the big imagination, is already one and the same with the truth. So uh, it's not really relevant to a discussion of finding the truth, see? It's already that. But anything less than that is a, is imagined, a pheno is phenomena. And the only way to get to the truth is to transcend it, to see beyond it especially the individual self, to see that, uh, you know, the ego uh, isn't that. It's just an uh, uh, imagined uh, being. Yeah, I would say most people, most of the time, are, are trapped by their imagination. It's at least the false <laughs> yes, information. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what I mean when I say the the imagination is this kind of overarching power that makes everything appear, all of us, you know, it, it, okay, so just to reframe it by changing words, you know, in uh, Buddhism and the Advaita traditions, we can call this imagination maya, you know, it's illusion, or also uh, magic. And you're right. Just as the um, the teachings say, we are, as individuals, trapped and spellbound by appearances, by th this maya, by this imagination. We, we are spellbound and trapped by thinking or imagining that we are an individual separate being, that we have our own power of imagination rather than uh, there's only one. That's why in one of the emails we equated imagination uh, to creating karma. Can you speak on that just briefly? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I think I mentioned that last month. So anytime you imagine something uh, and I'll pick obvious examples this is like you can see how it's at work in your life. At some point in your life, you imagine, oh, I would like to do this or I would like to accomplish this. You know, I'd like to be a writer or a jet pilot or, you know, I'd like to get married or I'd like to have children. Well, just imagining those things creates a kind of uh, karma in your life. And that plays out one way or another as soon as it becomes part of us. Can I say something about it? Sure. Yeah. But it's more of it, I think, but the previous question that what I what I've noticed is all these is I don't know strange experiences or uh, whatever we want to call them. They all they tend to most of them. There's a couple that I wouldn't know how to place more than a couple, but in general they tend to happen within the frame of thought in which I'm immersed at the moment. And I think they actually think that all these um, things that we perceive that are kind of out of the norm to say it, what I've noticed is in a way they deeply adjust to our personalities and preferences. In a way, if you like sense of humor or like a certain type of visual thing, but more than anything, I would say they they adjust to your frame of thought, meaning if you are a Christian and you are going to have a perception of unity, it will happen probably, or if you are a Catholic with Virgin Mary, right? And if you, I had, I had perceptions of unity at some point, like 
complete the unity between things and the consciousness. I was at a canyon. More than, I had it one more than once. And it was pure love, pure affection. And I knew the place knew. I don't even know how to explain. It was very nonlinear. But what I can say, and I had many of those that they always happen in the frame of what I was very immersed at the time. Had I been a Buddhist, maybe it would be, and if I was a Tibetan Buddhist, it would be one of the Tibetan deities. And I don't know, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, so they I are not the end because they're so shaped right. by your... Yeah, so, yeah, but, uh, you know, what this points to is really what I'm already saying, which is that the the reality is beyond the image. There is an, there is an image that appears, but the, the reality is beyond that. So, Matthew, would you say that your experience with a seagull or what Claire was alluding to or any of the experiences that uh, all of us raised our hand for, would those would that come from big imagination? Yes, everything comes from big imagination. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. <laughs> everything. <laughs> so, yes, absolutely. Yeah, in the same, that's why I compared it to the present experience. Yeah, yeah. Or, or a dream or a, all experience. See, from the from the perspective of the big imagination or reality itself or consciousness itself, all experiences are the same experience. So it it, it may they appear in you know uh, endless different variety, but the the experience is of the self or of the one of the unity. Everything yeah. else just appears in that. So that's why I say it's not important to decide whether they're real or not real. Mm -hmm. Unless unless you're intent on deciding that about the present experience in the same way. See, you have to investigate everything equally. If you're going to say about an extraordinary experience, is this real or not real? You have to also answer the same question for the present experience. And for a dream. What if that experience is a spontaneous slip into oneness? Is that, what is that? It is what it is. See, it is as you described it. <clears throat> We're right at the edge, see, where you can't really say anything. Okay. You know, you just say, well, it's it's nothing. I already said everything is the big imagination. So in, if you go far enough, there's not even any illusion. See, there's no. There's no distinctions whatsoever if you go far enough. So, David, you said slip into. Tell us about slipping out of it. If you went into it, are you still into it or did you slip out of it? I'm in, a, I'm in and out. <laughs> I'm in and out, Larry. It's part of the frustration. <laughs> it's, part of the, it's part of the gift and the wonder and also part of the, um, the yearning, the commitment to a path. Let, let me just say, uh, say this, uh, like uh, something to ponder for people. Um, if it's oneness, how do you slip out of it? Hmm. How about a spontaneous glimpse into oneness? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I shared the experience. No, I, I know what you're saying. I'm just, I'm just trying to push in the direction of seeing just how radical this oneness is. You're never out of it. There, there is the perception or the feeling that one is out of it or one is separate. But that too is nothing but that. Once you uh, let go of the idea that you are you personally are something separate or have any, uh, like a separate mind or something like that. Mm 
then it because then you see there's nothing there's not there's no um, there's nowhere to get to the present experience is that oneness whether it seems like oneness or not at any given moment it is complete it, it see that the present experience is always complete So the the direction is toward um, surrender of the individual self, the separate self. Uh, if that's done, then all this makes a lot more sense because there is no you to slip into or slip out of. There's no separate. Um, entity to discover this oneness. There's just oneness. You know, so, so many traditions point to this. You know, Ramana said, there's nothing but the self. Nothing. Nothing. That's it. There's nothing but that. You know, the uh, in Judaism, they say there's, uh, you know, the Lord is one. One. You know, capital O. Um, you know, in Christianity, you have, you know, Jesus said, I and the Father are one, one. So there's all, all of these pointers toward oneness. In Buddhism, they have, uh, uh, you know, form is emptiness, emptiness is form. This is a encapsulation of oneness. Matthew, I am going to redirect us towards the experiential part. We have a half an hour left. Okay, yeah, let's get to the fun stuff. <laughs> Good, because this hasn't been any fun at all. <laughs> okay, well, th this part's going to be good, all right? <laughs> so just hang in there. Buckle up. <laughs> okay. Um, so I have a couple of different... Uh, you know, just little exercises. Um, and the important thing about these exercises when you do them is um, just like in meditation exercises, it's important not just to listen to the instructions and follow them, but to really pay attention to what's going on in your own experience when you do follow the instructions because uh you know that's what can lead to insight you know where you you uh, uh notice what's going on with the experience so um, otherwise they will just seem like silly instructions here's the first exercise i call it um apple no apple <laughs> so you can um uh, eyes closed or Open doesn't really matter. It involves visualization, so you might naturally want to close your eyes. On the inhale, I want you to form in your mind the image of an apple. If you can't um, form an image in your mind, just say to yourself the word apple so that it brings to mind your conception of apples. And on the exhale, I want you to uh, say to yourself, no apple, and make this image or uh, held in the mind concept vanish. Again, on the inhale, say to yourself, apple, and make it appear. On the exhale, say to yourself, no apple, make it vanish really vanish, gone from the mind, not even the thought remaining. Just try that a few times. Inhale, apple. Exhale, no apple.
Good. Let's uh, let's discuss <laughs> what your uh, experience of this exercise is. Were you able to do it? Were you able to make the apple really disappear? And were you able to make it appear? I could do it, but I couldn't do it as fast as a breath. Ah. I, you know, I, I found that it was still kind of wanting to linger in a, in a way, like there was still like a ghost of an apple or something. Ah. So I decided to cheat and do, I'd go inhale, a, 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 exhale, that would be apple. And then the second one, I'd make me no apple. And if I did it like that, I could do it. I see. Tying it to the breath in some way does help. Um, that's a good workaround if you can't do it just on an inhale, or you can slow the inhale down, slow the, uh, slow the exhale. It, the other thing you can do is when you inhale, imagine the inhale actually pulling the mm. image together and mm. uh, actually the inhale forming the image. Mm. Yeah. And then when you exhale, it's gone. I changed to a banana. <laughs> it was easier I was, it was easier <laughs> really cheating really cheating i struggled with an apple and it was easy oh yeah oh that's interesting I, I, I'll, I'll have to experiment with that <laughs> banana was easier choose your <laughs> i'll tell people that in the future if you can't do apple try banana i hear it's easier <laughs> what i found is i could dissolve it it was easier when I breathed in, this is probably obvious, I could visualize it. And when I breathed out and had my eyes closed, I could still dissolve it, but it was much easier if I if I opened my eyes a little bit, it was much easier to let it go because I got distracted. Oh, you got, because you got other with, visual. Yeah. yeah, it just opened up more. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it disappeared. Right. Anybody else? For me, I think the fact that I could focus on it and then in the exhalation, vanished, made the exhalation more easy to connect with kind of like nothing, kind of like an empty, right. but the focusing on it first facilitated that. Right, exactly. Yeah, I think I think that's spot on, you know. Um, incidentally, uh, if you ever get a chance, um, uh, Alan Watts has this wonderful talk about uh, the word nirvana and how this word means blown out. Um, like an exhale, see, phew, he says, <laughs> phew. So it's a good, it's a good talk. But um, that is also the idea here. Yeah, and I think, um, I think you're right by, by focusing the image uh, and tying it to the breath that helps on letting it go. So let's try another one. It's uh, very similar, but uh, it um, scales up. So this one I call um, exploding bubbles. So on the inhale, I want you to form the image of a bubble around your body. And on the exhale, explode the bubble. Inhale, form a bubble around your body. And on the exhale, it's gone. Now on the inhale, I want you to form a bubble the size of the room that you're in. And on the exhale, it's gone.
how on the inhale, I want you to form a bubble the size of the whole earth. And on the exhale, it's gone. Now, on the inhale, form a bubble that is as big as the whole universe. And on the exhale, it's gone. What was your experience? With the apple, I could see it clearly come and go. And it even had colors and was backlit from a different part of the room. But when we went to the room size, I could put the bubble around the room, but I couldn't there was no color. There was no shape in it. Yeah, it's more. And I could do the bubble around planet Earth, but I couldn't do a bubble around the universe. I just couldn't. <laughs> I couldn't it becomes get... it becomes more and more abstract, more right. more conceptual. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Anybody else? For me, I could feel pulling the bubble or the egg around me, and it felt very claustrophobic. And then when it burst, it felt very vast. Um, it was, um, the room was more difficult. The earth was a big challenge. Um, uh, but the universe also, I could, I could imagine a bubble around everything. It's kind of just as big as possible. Yeah, right. <laughs> just everything. I could do the little bubble and the big bubble, but the <laughs> intermediate bubbles were harder. Yeah. But I but the small bubble around myself, the claustrophobic feeling, and then the expansiveness, uh, those shift were very noticeable. Yeah. Yeah, this is, you know, in a, in a way, this is really just an exercise in recognizing that limitate the limits that we imagine are imaginary. Um, mm. See, they, they can come and go on the inhale and the exhale, and they're formed in the mind. It, it was, I thought it was a fantastic, uh, fun. Uh, exercise. <laughs> um, it reminded me of your account of awakening, actually, um, because I couldn't help. I think, OK, the bubble, you know, everything inside the bubble is me and everything outside the bubble is, you right. know, not right. me. You yes, know? Yeah. And the popping of it was like. OK, you know, and the bigger the bigger the bubble got, it got it was like your thing. It's like, you know, inside and outside just went away. That's right. That's right. When when you when you pop the bubble what you're doing is is looking at what is the experience when there is no limit there is no even even the limit as big as the universe right is it, we imagine that there is a limit but but that 
again, the limit is imagined. So burst that bubble and then you can you you see what is uh, it to be no limit. And you can do that with the universe, the body, the mind. Uh, you know, you can inhale or or the self, inhale and form a picture of what it is that you think you are, be it your body or your mind, wh whatever it is that you think the individual self is, form that image in your mind. And on the exhale, gone, just like the apple. Yeah, I thought that is fantastic. Although I will say the universe took me more than one breath. I <laughs> got to work on it. It's 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 big. It's big. <laughs> one breath. <laughs> Anybody else who hasn't shared yet want to say something? I think um, I'm just appreciating from both those exercises in a small and big way, like the power of our minds to go one place and then shift it to another, which there's a whole lot around that in terms of what we do to ourselves or any situation. So, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, it's, the mind's amazing, you know? Um, yeah. So on that note, let's, let's try another one. Because uh, this, this one is more mental, more mind-centered uh, instead of Im imagery. Um, this actually comes from a, a, a kind of like a mantra that I gave myself when I was um, in college for a pe small period of time. And it uh, definitely put me into a strange uh, uh, mind space and gave me that kind of... Uh, uh, you know, around that time, I had some glimpses into oneness, <laughs> as you do, you know. Um, anyway, here's the the mantra or the exercise. It's a it's a thought. You have to really think it through, and you have to really believe it. So, here's the thought. Uh, it's everything is. A, uh, my imagination. Everything is a figment of my imagination. But that statement also is just a figment of my imagination. Or you can say, everything is my imagination but that is just my imagination, see? And you can just think it through over and over. Everything is my imagination, but that is just my imagination. Any uh, interesting insights or experiences with this one?
Well, for me, that one uh, kind of reminds me of this idea that I think I shared with you, Matthew, on email uh, of uh, Aja Shanti saying that this kind of sometimes this realization is like is like a checkmate. Yeah, you put yeah. the mind, you put the mind in checkmate. Absolutely. And so I, I feel like that exercise is the same thing for me as this idea of folding everything in. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's also one. a way of checkmating the mind. Yeah. And the image that I got there doing at that time was like that I was in the middle of one of these house of mirrors and all the mirrors, you know, were just like <laughs> reflecting back and there was no way to go, nowhere out, nowhere. Ah, out. Yeah, yeah. Trapped. No way out. No escape. Yeah. That's good. I, very, very interesting visual. Um, uh elements in that but yeah i, I love that um uh teaching by adra shanti of checkmating the mind as a chess player <laughs> it's it's great but also uh it's very appropriate because the, the, yeah the mind is very tricky and it needs to be checkmated it needs to be put in a place where it has no escape where it can't get away with its little tricks and, um, you know, various teachings are meant to do this, uh, like uh, mantras and, and like Zen koans are basically meant to checkmate the mind as well. Um, and so that is, you know, that's part of the endeavor. You know, even just basic meditation is a way of checkmating the mind. You sit there, right? And now you've got to deal with it. This crazy mind of yours. You know, the game has begun. <laughs> you know? So, great. yeah, and I'll just say, one question I was sitting with also was I was kind of curious why you chose to focus on imagination a little bit here, where I, I've been seeing that as this dialogue and time together has been going on. I felt like, well, it's the same thing as views. Yeah. You know, we kind of have looked at this idea, this word of views to give us this insight into or a pointing right and so it just seems like a, a very similar word so it, using this same kind of metaphor of this checkmate i feel like all these different words are kind of like you know they're kind of stacking up so that there's no little escape it's like well maybe it's this no, yeah, it's no. Not, you know that one so then you get this kind of whole surround with all these different words that are very similar but a little different maybe you know that's no that's that's very perceptive yeah you know this is why you know i approach these topics through many different words because the mind will try to escape by through a different word oh maybe like you said maybe it's this thing over here you know when you when you approach nothing the mind will do anything to think of something else. You know, it wants to, it will say, oh, uh, what about this other thing? You know, it could be that, you know, it's always trying to propose as the something as what you're seeking. And so you're, you're right. That's, you know, one of the reasons why, you know, it's like, I don't have one vocabulary, you know, imagination, view, you know, you start to see that all these things are the same. Oh, I, you mean I can't come up with a different idea? No, that idea is the same idea. All the ideas are the same idea. They're just different versions, different ways of trying to put off really... Um, going beyond the a concept just an idea or going so, or going beyond uh, ourselves i felt nauseated what's that i felt almost like nausea ah <laughs> <laughs> no seriously and, and i felt it with the bubble too is so constrictive and I have felt it. There were there's been times in which everything is so synchronized and things happen in a so strange way that I got one day to the point of 
it, it was created out of anguish because I could really see that the world is like a theater scenography. I don't know if that's a word, but like a montage. Yeah. And I had to call the spirit to say, stop, because every, everything was up. I don't know. I could really feel everything is a creation of my mind, no matter what was happening. And lately I feel almost a nausea because I feel that way. And I feel the only escape will be silence. Total silence, total nothingness. It's just that sometimes I don't know how to get there. And so the exercise was oppressive <laughs> to me. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So just um, you have to you have to burst that bubble. Yeah. See, let go. Exhale. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. The like like a you know like a Zen koan is like that too, right? You're just ah, I can't figure it out. You know, it's like your brain is in a rat maze or something, and and uh, you can't stop. So. Um, yeah, the, you know, the release does only, in my experience, relief really comes from that spontaneous release, from letting go, letting go of the, uh, all this, the kaleidoscope, you know, that's, that's one of the phrases that I often use is like a kaleidoscope, you know, um, and letting go of that is there is a, a deeper silence and and uh that silence is uh closer to the truth than anything we can possibly imagine or anything that we can possibly come up with any idea any concept any thought any image so try to you know find that silence in the midst of whatever is going on. We're getting close to the end. Let me uh, let me give you one more as kind of homework, and then we'll take any final questions if there are any. Um, so this one is just uh, looking for nothing or looking for that silence. And how, how do you do it? As I mentioned uh, earlier, you can't do it by looking for nothing as if it's something. You will the mind will turn the nothing into something and you'll once again be caught in a, a kaleidoscope of ideas and thoughts and concepts, even if it's a concept of nothing. So the only way to do it is by dismissing anything particular that arises. So whatever it is that the mind seems to want to latch onto as uh, something that would be productive or something that would be closer to the truth or something that is the truth or or so on. If it is something and you're looking for nothing, uh, dismiss it. And you can dismiss it in the same way that you burst bubbles or in the same way that you make apples disappear. You could even inhale and bring that concept of that idea or that thought into focus in your mind and on the exhale release it and you can use this also pr practically um, to dispel negative thoughts negative emotions, uh, pain, uh, and so on. So you can use this same idea. Inhale, bring it into focus. Exhale, it's gone. And you could do this for thousands of different things and still not find nothing. 
And that's because the common thing in all of our experiences is our self. So, you know, after you have some practice dispelling other things, try to bring yourself into focus and uh, make yourself vanish. Great seeing everybody. I'll do a quick, quick blessing. Thank you, Bruce. Um, may, through our practice, may we go deeper and deeper and find freedom in nothing and in silence, abandoning everything. And then may we, in the compassionate field we're in, bring ourselves to address the needs of this world and others that are less fortunate than us. May it be so. May it be so, indeed. Thank you, Bruce. And thanks, everyone. Thank you, Matthew. Bless you all. We'll see you in a month. One one thing that that when you say look for nothing, Matthew, my experience is recognize nothing. If you're looking for it, you don't find it. But if you recognize it, mm. sure. you, yes, this is, yeah. there's a, just the word difference. Yes, or, you you can change the words however you, however you need. Of course, the nothing is always present. It's yeah. never absent, so, yeah. Thanks, everyone. Peace Thank to you all. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Good seeing you, Teddy. Bye, Thank Jean. you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye, Gene. Good seeing you. Yeah. Good seeing you, Matthew.